Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 10 of Experiencing MIS. Um, this whole chapter is a very brief overview of security concepts for information systems. And you might be looking at the length of the chapter or the length of all of these videos and wondering, well, how in the world is this very brief? Trust me, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into security and a lot of that stuff is extremely technical. Uh, that's not the goal for this chapter, is to talk about the extreme technicalities of stuff. We'll get, our, we'll dip our toes a little bit into a little bit of technicality, but for the most part, the idea is to educate you to understand, you know, what kind of things are going on with security. What should you be aware of? What should you be trying to put into any information systems you control, whether it's personal, like a uh, laptop that you're using to do work, or whether you are in charge of a larger scale information system in an organization, and you have to make sure that that information system is secure. So ideally, you know, and especially in the latter case where you're working in an organization and you have a number of people that you're working with in order to make this information system. Uh, the idea is that you would want to be able to work with security professionals, um, but also have some kind of idea of what you need for your information system based on what that information system has and based on some of the concepts that we're talking about here. So that is generally what we're trying to do here now. I will say that I wouldn't personally consider myself nor the author's uh, security experts per se. If anything, this should be more of a jumping off point where you hear me talk about something or you read what the textbook says about something and then you try to do some of your own research or you talk to um, any security experts that you happen to be working with about these kinds of topics. and that kind of stuff will hopefully help bring your information systems that you're working with to a more secure place. So that's my hope for this chapter. Also, I wanna give the heads up that we have another situation where the authors have gotten some things wrong in this textbook. Uh, I'll try to clear up any misconceptions where I am able to throughout this series of videos. That all being said, uh, let's get into it. So this first video is going to talk about information systems security in a brief sort of like overview. So we're going to talk about some broader concepts with security before we actually start getting into some of the nitty gritty details of prevention and response, all that kind of stuff. So right here, we're just going to focus on the overview. Now for information systems security, we're going to define that as the protection of digital assets from unauthorized access. Now, security does have a broader definition in terms of uh, this protection uh, with regards to feeling safe or feeling that the things you have are safe, you know, all that kind of stuff. but when we're talking about the security of information systems, we're talking about the protection of digital assets that might be things like data that you have stored in your information systems. That might be the actual uh, hardware or software that you're using in the information systems themselves. Those can get affected by a security breach, but a little bit more on that later. But typically we're talking about uh, protecting digital assets from any manner of unauthorized access. Unauthorized access meaning someone was able to look at them or take them or change them or something like that who wasn't actually supposed to or they were able to do it in a way that they weren't supposed to even if they normally do have access for you know working with that stuff for the right reasons. So it could either be someone who isn't allowed in there at all messing with digital assets or someone who normally is allowed to work with those digital assets doing something for the wrong reasons for malicious reasons so that's the idea of uh, security here that we're working with 
Now, security comes with trade-offs. I had a professor who uh, taught us how operating systems work uh, when I was in college, and he described the most secure system in the world as if you take a computer with all of your data in it, submerge it in concrete, and then throw it down the Marianas Trench. It's very secure because nobody who is not able to, who should not be able to access that data will be able to access that data because it's at the bottom of the Marianas Trench encased in concrete. So perfect. We have the perfectly secure system. Our information system is great. Everything is just fine, right? Well, the problem with that is that the people who are supposed to work with that data also can't use that data as well. Uh, unless they're trying to James Cameron submarine down there and grab the computer, chisel it out of the concrete, plug a USB drive in, work with that data, unplug it, fill the hole in the concrete, and then chuck it back down to the Marianas Trench again. So, kind of a pain to work with, right? That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about with trade-offs, is sometimes you can have too much security. If you make things too secure, it can get in the way of doing actual work. But if you make it really, really easy to actually work with your data and all that kind of stuff, then you can have loss of security that leads to unauthorized access. So there's a lot of trade-offs you have to balance here. Let's talk about a few of them. The biggest one, the one that typically defines security here, is the trade-off between security and freedom to act. If you have a secure system, what that means is that you can't just do anything you want to. You can't access any data that you want. You can't do things whatever way that you want to. Security is going to come with very specific procedures that people have to follow. And we'll get into this a little bit throughout the rest of this chapter. But security comes with procedures. It comes with a uh, restriction of access. It comes with a lot of stuff that are designed to protect the actual information system, which means that you're not free to do whatever in a secure system. So the more security you have, the harder it is to do whatever you want, the less freedom to act in whatever way you want to you have. And this applies for any definition of security. If you have a um, if you're someone who cares about your physical security, maybe you think that people are out to get you for whatever reason, you might do things like install a home security system, uh, hire a private security team, all that kind of stuff, but that comes with a loss of freedom to act because everywhere you go, you have to coordinate with your private security team, you have to um, actually identify who you are, you have to authorize guests to come in, and even then, they might only be able to stay with you for a certain amount of time under supervision, so you can't just talk about anything. With your security system, you know, you have to uh, set it every time you leave the house. You First thing you do as soon as you get into the house is you have to uh, deactivate it so it doesn't um, automatically call uh, whatever security or law enforcement or whatever service is running the thing. So anytime you have that kind of stuff, you lose some amount of freedom to act. And of course, that's an extreme example right there, um, especially for the very uh, wealthy in terms of hiring that security team or something like that. Um, very extreme example, but I think it does a good job of illustrating this security versus freedom to act idea here. Now, while security versus freedom to act really helps define what security is, there are other trade-offs. For example, security versus convenience, which is pretty similar to freedom to act as is, but um, when, you, when you actually have a secure system here, it means that you can't just do whatever. We talked a little bit about uh, security with the cloud and sensitive data and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you are in an organization that is working with medical records, let's say, uh, you don't, you aren't able to upload those medical records up to just any old cloud provider. 
uh, there might be some that are licensed to do that kind of stuff, but like you couldn't use, um, let's say you couldn't use Google Drive to store everything. So if you're really familiar with Google Drive or with Microsoft OneDrive or something like that, if you're really familiar with any of those and you just think, oh, well, it'll be so easy for me to drag and drop everything onto those cloud services, that would just be super convenient to let me do that. Well, when you have to actually have data security for that kind of thing, for patient records and stuff like that, you know, there's all these limits on who is actually able to access that data, what people are able to do with that data. There's specific procedures on how to make copies of data, where to store data, and likely OneDrive and Google Drive and all that kind of stuff are not going to be allowed. So that limited access and all of those strict procedures are going to remove a whole bunch of convenience because you can't just drag and drop stuff onto OneDrive or Google Drive or something like that. So that's just one possible example. Um, another one might be a security policy in an organization that requires you to um, log out of your account every hour or so. Like maybe they just automatically log you out after an hour of inactivity, which is going to lose you some convenience. Let's say you go on a one hour lunch break um, and then you come back and you have to log back in and oh, that's so inconvenient, but it's secure because it would prevent anyone from uh, logging onto, or I guess doing anything in your accounts with that organization uh, if you've been gone for more than an hour. So there's that security measure uh, that does take away a little bit of, of uh, convenience. You can also have security versus privacy trade-offs. Um, one thing that we will talk about with regards to uh, security is how to try to ensure security with the people that work in an organization. So if you're trying to apply for an organization that has a lot of security, they might do all kinds of things like uh, try to look at your background. They'll ask you to do a background check and all that kind of stuff. So look at a lot of information about you that way. They'll probably be monitoring your emails and communications through any company run platform. They'll probably be monitoring any web traffic to some extent, maybe not actively, but passively at the very least with some sort of uh, blocking of certain sites or some notification if you go to a suspicious site that tells the IT team, which then tells um, you know whoever else needs to see that kind of thing. There might be a certain amount of monitoring of the work that you are doing on network traffic. So because of all that, in order to ensure that there is security for this organization, they have taken away employee privacy to some extent. Now security versus privacy in people's private lives can actually be a pretty um, tough balance to hit because a lot of extreme privacy measures that people take in order to try not to be monitored by big companies and stuff like that can get to the point of being insecure if they're going really, really, really far with it or if they're not being careful or something like that. On the flip side, if someone is trying to be super, super secure, they might have um, some, uh, you know, anti-malware programs or some kind of monitoring thing that monitors all the uh, traffic coming in and out of their computer, coming in and out of their router. They might be using a, a VPN, especially one that they didn't build themselves because, hey, that's more secure than trying to build it yourself and possibly getting something wrong. We're not going to really talk about all that kind of stuff. But in the name of security, they could be doing all this kind of stuff and then sharing a lot of data with a lot of different companies, uh, either because it helps them stay more secure or they're doing it because uh, the companies that they're choosing for services like a VPN or a um, anti-malware system or something like that are using that data in order to make some sort of profit and then giving the benefit of anti-malware or VP having a VPN or something like that. Just an example of how wild it can get with the private life. Um, some people choose to even go as far as 
make their own operating system. So instead of using Windows or something like that, they might try to uh, just make an operating system from the ground up in the name of security or in the name of privacy, I should say, in order to not have anything tracking them or something like that. But that might open up a lot of security flaws because when you make an operating system like that, there's a lot of security concerns that you need to go into it. And one person alone is probably not going to do the best job of uh, addressing all those security concerns. So you can get some extremes on security that get rid of privacy, some extremes on privacy that get rid of security. And ideally you want to meet somewhere in the middle. And then you have cost versus effectiveness. Implementing security systems and procedures and training people in procedures and all that kind of stuff is going to cost a lot of money, but it's going to be super effective. So high, you can have high cost, high effectiveness. You can have low cost, low effectiveness. Um, and if you are in more of a management or accounting or something like that position in an organization, you have to try to evaluate what amount of effectiveness is the right amount? Like, no security system is going to be 100% effective. So accepting that and then trying to figure out the amount of risk you are okay with having in your organization is really important. You find that level of risk that you're okay with that balances the cost of... The system that you're installing with the effectiveness of that system and the risk that goes along with the fact that it's not 100% effective. So lower cost equals more risk, uh, higher cost equals less risk. Kind of have to balance all that out, uh, especially in management position. Uh, as someone, if you end up in the position of someone who is actually in charge of building an information system and assembling the um, the actual components and getting the security in there and all that kind of stuff, which you should be designing for security from the start. Um, probably what you would have is you would have the security expert that you're working with to figure out what kind of security you need. And then you would also have, let's say, people from accounting or something like that working with the budget. And you would probably want to be in communication with all of them to make sure that you are hitting this balance just right. You don't want to go over budget, but you don't want to go too high with risk. So working with other people here is going to be really important. That's why, you know, you keep in mind that a security trade-off is cost versus effectiveness, and you work with those experts as you're building the information system. Now in security, we tend to have a threat loss model, and we're going to start with more of the threat side of things here. Uh, a threat is a person or organization seeking to obtain or alter digital assets maliciously. And like I talked about before, this could be someone outside of the organization that you work for, outside of your organization or someone who's not you, you know, someone external to this information system. Or it could be someone from the inside who is doing malicious actions for whatever reason. So Anyone who wants to bypass your security and mess around with your digital assets, that is what we would consider the threat. A vulnerability would be an opportunity for threats to gain access to whatever uh, digital assets that they want. So this could be um, some kind of hole in a firewall, uh, and we'll define that term in a little bit. This could be a window that can be easily broken and leads right into a data center where they can just plug a USB in and get everything. That could also be a vulnerability. These vulnerabilities could be physical, they could be digital, they could be vulnerabilities with people as well, people who accidentally leak information. They could be vulnerabilities with the procedures. Uh, if, let's say, um, a security guard consistently doesn't check one window or door or something like that and someone is able to get in that way or if uh, people uh, use insecure methods to 
upload data to a cloud or there's a number of digital or physical vulnerabilities that could be out there. Uh, and we'll actually talk about a few ways in which vulnerabilities can be exploited in the future. A safeguard is one single measure taken to block a threat. So for example, um, if it is possible to break a window and end up in the room with all the data, uh, perhaps putting a locked door between that window and the data so that the data is locked away and everything is fine. Or if that window is in the same room as all the data, moving the servers containing the data to another room with no windows and only one entrance, which is a locked door that uh, requires a long passcode or something like that, uh, that could be a safeguard. So a safeguard could be uh, locks on doors. It could be um, programs that are used to prevent digital intrusion into a network. It could be security guards. It could be all manner of things. Uh, they are not always going to be effective, though some safeguards are going to be more effective than others. Um, and safeguards are actually uh, security measures. When you implement safeguards, you are talking about security and they all have those trade-offs that we discussed previously. So, you know, cost versus effectiveness, uh, convenience versus uh, security, privacy versus security, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're not always effective. It might be possible to find a vulnerability inside of a safeguard. Uh, you can actually introduce a safeguard and uh, from there expose a new vulnerability. For example, if you install uh, electronic locks on all the doors of your organization's buildings to prevent people from getting in and messing with data, uh, it might be possible to bypass those electronic locks by using a screwdriver to bridge a couple connections and just getting in like that. Um, there are YouTube videos of people doing this in seconds. It is wild how they're able to. So uh, that's a possibility. You A uh, safeguard may not be 100% effective. Sometimes a safeguard introduces new vulnerabilities. You will probably need multiple safeguards because uh, the idea is that if a vulnerability might get through one safeguard, it might be caught by a second. Even if that second one has a vulnerability, uh, the intrusion method that got past the first may not get past the second. So it might be vulnerable to a different intrusion method that was not able to get past the first. And then if you have a third layer of safeguards, that makes it even harder for one particular intrusion method to get through or something like that. So safeguards are the things that prevent uh, intrusions. They uh, safeguard they, they try to address vulnerabilities, though they might have vulnerabilities in themselves. And of course, the target is the asset desired by a threat. Um, in the more modern computer age, this is probably going to be data, especially data about customers. You see a lot of um, you see a lot of data breaches involving things like emails, passwords, credit card information. If the company was stupid enough to store credit card information, which you should never do. Um, or uh, even worse, things like social security IDs or health records or something like that, if this is a healthcare company. Uh, a lot, that, that's what a lot of people are going for when they're targeting hospitals, because uh, that kind of information can be worth quite a bit. So, uh, that is what a target is. It's whatever a threat wants to get access to from an information system. That's the whole reason why they're breaking in. So we have a table containing two situations right here. Uh, you want to read this left to right. Um, well, it's, it's technically three situations. So we'll talk about the first two of them first, the ones that start with hacker wants to steal your bank login credentials. So the threat is the hacker, the target is the bank login credentials. They want those because once they have that, they'll probably be able to transfer a whole bunch of money out of your bank. 
The vulnerability that they can try to exploit is they can create a phishing site nearly identical to your online banking site. Now, phishing, uh, we might talk about this more in a little bit, but phishing is essentially a, uh, a malicious actor um, will email you pretending to be some organization or some person that you trust. So, so they might, in this case, they would email you pretending to be your bank and they might have something really urgent in their message. Like, hey, um, we just saw this suspicious trans uh, transaction in your account. Uh, you need to log in right away and take and uh, answer some questions or we might uh, have to alert the IRS or something like that. So you might see this message and panic and be like, oh no, that's really bad. So you click on the enclosed link and that takes you to a fake website that is designed to look like the real website that you're used to visiting. It looks almost exactly the same. There might be a couple small differences, but at a quick glance, and your glance might be quick if you are panicking because your bank is gonna call the IRS on you, you might not notice it. It will have a login field, so you would put in your username, put in your password, and submit it, but instead of it going to your bank, you input it on this fake website and you send it directly to the hacker. Now the hacker is going to give you a message that kind of throws you off the scent. They might say, um, our website is down, uh, come back in like an hour or something like that. Um, or they might uh, re even redirect you to the real page. I don't know. They might, they might do something. Uh, to kind of throw you off the scent. Even they might redirect you to a uh, fake page that says thank you by uh, confirming who you are. You have, uh, you've told us that everything is fine, so we will not be contacting the IRS and you go about your day. But they have your information. So the first thing they're going to do is log in. They'll probably change your password so that you can't actually get into your own bank account. And then they start siphoning money as best as they can. And by the time the bank realizes something is wrong, uh, they might have already wired away so much that you can't really do anything about it. So that's the idea of a phishing site. P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, phishing. So what's happening here, and the situation that I actually uh, described is this uh, bottom sort of sub row of this hacker uh situation right here and i you know honestly i would also say that hacker is maybe not the right term for someone doing a phishing scam but regardless um the safeguard is not there was no safeguard against you getting fished because you didn't recognize the email it didn't know how to check if the website is actually real or not the result of that is uh because you had no safeguard, you input your login credentials, uh, give that to the criminal, uh, who then was able to do all this bad stuff. Uh, so the reason why you lost your login credentials there is because uh, your safeguard, which was actually non-existent, was ineffective. Now, if you had a safeguard in this situation, uh, the safeguard here might be only access sites using HTTPS, and I'll explain what HTTPS means in a little bit uh, down the line. We'll actually talk about what, the difference between HTTP and HTTPS, but essentially HTTPS is a guarantee that the website you're visiting is actually the real website. So if you go to your bank's website, let's say bank.com, and you see HTTPS, www.bank.com, you are much more likely to be on your bank's actual website. However, if you use, uh, if you click the link and you realize you are on HTTP colon slash slash www.bank.com, it might be troublesome uh, because if HTTPS allows a website to verify that it is the real website for your bank, 
but then you see that you were on the HTTP version, HTTP does not have that guarantee and it could be someone spoofing things in some way. So what you would want to do then is close that tab, uh, get out of the, the fake website and then actually go, you know, maybe either through a search engine or uh, typing in the website yourself, https colon slash slash www.bank.com. Um, doing that would actually send you to the real website or you could then safely log in and then also maybe you would want to call your uh, bank and report the scam. But if you notice that the uh, link that you are about to click or if you've already clicked the link, the website that you're currently on is using HTTP, that is a possible sign. And I want to say it's a possible sign that you are not on the real website. So if you see that and you go out of that tab and you go to the real bank's website, typing it in manually yourself or uh, going to a bookmark or actually going to your search engine or something like that, then the result is you don't lose your login, your login credentials because then you are logging into your bank's real website, which means that that particular safeguard happened to be effective for that particular, um, for that particular uh, phishing attempt. Now, it is possible that you uh, get a phishing site that uses HTTPS but it uses a URL that looks like bank.com, but is slightly uh, dissimilar. So like bamk.com, bank.com might at quick glance look similar to bank.com. You might not notice the difference and because uh, they might actually be able to get a real um, certificate that says, hey, I'm the real bamk.com. Uh, you can visit me and know that you are really at BAMK.com, not bank.com, BAMK.com. Uh, so then if you are just looking for HTTPS, then you say, okay, well, I'm on the HTTPS site and this looks like my bank uh, login site. So I'm going to log in right now. And then you've still lost your login credentials. So in that situation, it wouldn't be effective. Um, so you would also want to check the URL very carefully before actually proceeding to clicking on your link and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of ways that you can try to detect a phishing scam. Um, things like the uh, urgency of the message or um, incorrect URL or lack of HTTPS or something like that. Um, all of those could be possible signs. Also, your bank is probably not going to email you like that and say, hey, we are calling the IRS until you log in immediately. Um, they are probably going to request that you log into the banking website and check uh, a message or something like that from inside of the website. And they're not going to give you a link like that. You actually have to go and log in yourself. So kind of a tangent on how to avoid a phishing scam like that, but it's very useful knowledge. People fall for them all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But if, a, if you get a message that either is terrifying and makes it seem like you're going to lose your job or financial stability or get arrested or something like that in exactly three hours if you don't follow this link immediately, or if you get something that seems a little bit too good to be true it's always worth double checking the message double checking any urls they want you to click all that kind of stuff all right well after all that i'm going to talk about the other scenario right here uh the employee posts sensitive data to a public google plus group funny that they use google plus in this example uh i'm pretty sure it's, that's been defunct for a while or at least very few people are on it at this point um an employee posts sensitive data to a Google Plus group. The threat in this case is the employees uh, themselves, I believe, um, because the employee is actually the one posting that data, whether they are maliciously doing it or not maliciously doing it. 
um, the employee has actually done the work to uh, distribute that sensitive data. And the sensitive data is the loss. The vulnerability here is uh, public access to the not secure group. If it's a public Google Plus group, the way that it worked is that anybody could join that group and see what was being posted within that group, which means that anybody would be able to see that really sensitive data. Now, the safeguard here would be things like passwords, procedures, and employee training. So making sure that the sensitive data might be password protected or something like that, so only a few people could access it. Uh, the procedures would be education to let the employee... Uh, to, actually, sorry, the procedures would be uh, specific procedures for how you are able to access that data and what you are able to do with that data that leave nothing to be questioned here because you don't want anything up in the air in case an employee misreads these procedures and then thinks they're able to post it to a public group like that. And then employee training, telling them that this isn't okay, this is actually very dangerous. Uh, it could be really bad, it could uh, cost you your job, it could even hypothetically be a crime, depending on how they went about doing it. The result of this loss of sensitive data, of course, and the explanation is an ineffective safeguard. Either the passwords were easily cracked or something like that, or the procedures for accessing and uh, sharing data were not well-defined or not strict enough or something like that, or the employee training was not good enough. Any of those could have explained why the employee was able to do that, uh, whether maliciously or not, anything in there could have explained it. So when we're talking about security here, we're talking about uh, all these th threats and all that kind of stuff. And there's three major sources of threats that we're really going to consider in this discussion. The first being human error. Sometimes uh, people can make a mistake and cause some sort of data loss. Uh, and I don't even necessarily mean uh, someone breaking in and stealing data at this point. It could also be something like an employee accidentally, uh, during a backup and restore procedure, accidentally puts installs an old version of a database on top of a new one. So erasing all that new data that was supposed to be backed up, all that new data is gone. Now there's just an old database with a whole bunch of stuff missing, and that could do a lot of damage. Or uh, an employee accidentally deleting a whole bunch of customer records. Um, you could also have things like poorly written procedures, uh, uh, errors in actually executing the different procedures. For example, if uh, when you're closing your building, you are supposed to lock the door and you forget to lock the door, that would be human error in terms of actually going through with the procedures. Uh, it could also be physical mistakes as well. Like if you knock over the server, the entire server uh, tower by accident and cause data loss that way. Um, it could be in the physical realm. Um, I do like the textbooks example of driving a forklift through the wall of a computer room and just destroying a whole bunch of data that way. Um, massive amount of human error that way. Also why people should be forklift certified and very careful on them. Uh, yeah, poorly written uh, programs as well because software can have uh, vulnerabilities that allow for people to get access to data that they're not supposed to. Uh, that could be human error. The, the programmers, even though they are outside of your, your organization potentially, uh, let's say even if they work for Microsoft or Google or something like that, if they make a mistake that causes your organization's data or other digital asset to get lost, um, that would be a uh, human error. Now there's computer crime, which is what we think about when we think about security. Uh, people actually intentionally breaking into a network and stealing data or destroying data or modifying data or something like that. Uh, this could be external. Uh, some hacker from the other side of the country 
getting in and wreaking havoc inside of the database, or this could be a disgruntled employee. Um, so any person who is intentionally trying to mess with uh, an organization's or a person's digital assets, this is going to fall under computer crime here. And then finally, there is natural events and disasters, which can cause damage to computers in a similar way that we're talking about with human error that cause uh, data loss. Um, it's not even just damages to computers, right? Because if you think about a tornado uh, yanking a server rack out of a, out of a building and flinging it into the middle of a pond 50 miles downwind, Definitely that is a natural event that causes data loss, but then also um, things like destroying network infrastructure. So destroying fiber optic lines, an earthquake destroying fiber optic lines uh, in the middle of the ocean could possibly be a, a threat source there, especially if say you're taking in a bunch of data, that connection gets severed, that data gets corrupted. Maybe that corruption also affects other parts of your system and things go bad that way. That could be an example. Uh, flooding, uh, fires, hurricanes, all that kind of stuff could constitute a threat. So we're going to now talk about the five different types of security loss. So if you are trying to protect your digital assets, not just from getting looked at or stolen, but also modified or deleted or something like that, you want to preserve them, you want to make sure that everything is intact and that uh, nobody who isn't supposed to look at them is actually able to look at them or modify them or whatever. When something like that happens, that is considered security loss. So when a threat actually succeeds at exploiting a vulnerability, you get security loss as a result. Let's look at the five types. The first is unauthorized data disclosure. A threat obtains data that is supposed to be protected. Uh, this could be a person who works inside the company accidentally releasing information to the world that never was supposed to be released. Uh, this could also talk about someone from the inside maliciously uh, releasing information. Uh, and it could also be someone external breaking in physically or digitally accessing that data and releasing it so that everyone is able to see it. Um, there are a lot of examples of unauthorized disclosure in the past, um, specifically uh, Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning have uh, done some very high profile examples of unauthorized data disclosure from the inside. Uh, I believe both of them used WikiLeaks, which is a platform specifically for unauthorized data disclosure. Um, I'm not gonna get into the politics of that, whether that kind of stuff is, uh, whether you believe that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you can, you could consider malicious data disclosure to be good in some instances. You could consider malicious data disclosure to be bad in some instances. Malicious would refer here to an intent to do harm to the organization that has the data that you're trying to release, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's necessarily bad or good depending on the situation, right? You have to analyze that kind of stuff ethically. We have the tools of uh, the categorical imperative and utilitarianism that you can use to possibly evaluate all that kind of stuff, but then also check to see if you agree with that kind of stuff. All that being said, um, that's just a, such such a brief peek into a lot of the ethics, ethical discussions that come into play with hacking and hacktivism and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of conversation to be had. Regardless, uh, that kind of stuff, that unauthorized data disclosure is usually what we think about when we hear about hacking. It's only one of the ways of security loss, but there's a lot of different ways in which unauthorized data disclosure can happen. So I'm going to kind of walk 
through all of those. You can have unauthorized data disclosure through human error, which was something like uh, the person accidentally posting uh, public, or sorry, sensitive information on a public Google Plus uh, group or something like that. Some kind of posting of sensitive information to social media. If it was done accidentally, if they didn't know that it was sensitive or if they thought they were sharing something else and accidentally uploaded something sensitive, that would be a human error caused unauthorized data disclosure. Uh, there are actually some uh, military simulator video games that have problems with unauthorized data disclosure, possibly of the human error kind, where people will have arguments about specifications of the different, uh, say, tanks or weapons or missiles or something like that because they're arguing about realism and then someone will post military documents uh, possibly believing that they were declassified when in reality they were still classified and that would count as unauthorized data disclosure and typically leads to criminal charges even if it was done unintentionally that's just something that seems to happen quite frequently as people um getting into these kinds of arguments and posting classified documents if it was uh accidental then that'd be human error. Now these next two, uh, pretexting and phishing, are going to be sort of clustered into a category of, um, I guess, behavior or action or something like that, that we would call social engineering, where you try to take advantage of things like social norms, politeness, of uh, humans' innate behavior to want to help, all that kind of stuff in order to take advantage of some situation. Now, these two specific types of social engineering often uh, are done to lead to some sort of unauthorized data disclosure. Uh, typically, uh, some sort of piece of information about a target that, that can then be used to either, you know, actually go in and get more data or uh, get some amount of money or something like that. Now, pretexting and phishing are pretty similar. Uh, pretexting tends to be uh, an action that takes place in meat space. Uh, it might be um, calling someone on the phone, pretending to be a credit card number or bank or something like that, asking for some sort of confirmation of identity for whatever scary reason that they're cooking up. Like, hey, uh, I guess kind of like what I said before, uh, weird charges on your bank and we're going to report this to the IRS unless you can validate who you are and tell us that you didn't make these charges. And then we'll try to investigate it as possible fraud on someone else's part. And then they try to use that to give, make you give you their information over the phone, which by the way, a bank or credit card company will never do. Um, Another example of this is someone might call you pretending to be a member of the FBI or someone from the local police department or something like that. They might call ahead and say, hey, we have a warrant out for your arrest. They might lead with that and then try to, you know, spin up some kind of like wild story or what they're trying to arrest you for and then have you divulge information over the phone. Now, uh, that may not necessarily be how the police actually conduct things because if they have a warrant out for your arrest already, that means that they want to take you in for questioning in a controlled environment where you cannot escape. They're not going to give you forewarning from what I am aware, they will not try to give you forewarning that they are going to try to arrest you and then coerce you to uh, pay some kind of fine or something like that over the phone before they then come to arrest you. That, that typically is not how that works, especially for things like overdue parking tickets or whatever. So that all would be an example of pretexting. And then phishing we talked about, it's pretty similar where uh, 
a scammer is going to reach out to you pretending to be a some sort of web based service that you are familiar with and then try to get you to uh, divulge some information like a password or a social security number or an account number or something like that something that they can use to get a lot of money off of you so two pretty similar things um, there's other types of social engineering as well uh, one actually fascinating example of pretexting that I've heard of is a I read a book by a former uh, private investigator who then uh, decided that he was done doing a whole bunch of this like really shady work where he was just helping people stalk people or something like that he couldn't really see himself do all this morale like do all this kind of stuff morally so he instead tried to help people learn how to disappear if they were uh running from uh bad people in their life or something like that but one story that he told is how back in the day of payphones what he would do is he would get a uh, bucket of change stand in that payphone and start calling different police stations pretending to be other police stations saying hey uh i'm from this police station x you know he would call x police station and say hey i'm from y police station uh we're trying to get more information on you know the person that he was paid to try to figure out what was going on with them we're trying to get more information on this kind of person uh can you help me um you know just share anything that you know and they wouldn't even check in uh he would be so confident and give like the right amount of details while not giving too much away that they would just believe him immediately and start sharing this sensitive information so it's a really interesting way of how pretexting could work at least back in that day when you could just use a payphone like that so now spoofing is going to seem very similar but it works quite differently because there's no social aspect here uh instead what you're going to do is you're going to sort of pretend to be someone else but from a sort of digital sense so for example um every buddy has an ip address associated with their house or place of business or something like that you have two actually ip addresses you have an external one which is when you visit a website from your house that's the ip address that that website would see and that has information about what city you're located in it might contain a little bit of information about who your isp is as well but also there's so few isps out there that they tend to have kind of a monopoly that it might just be easy to figure that out anyway i, I believe it does have information it does contain information on what um isp you are paying in order to actually have internet simply because isps control certain uh ip addresses but yeah there's that external ip address there's also an internal ip address if you are in your house connected to your router you have a specific ip address that your router uses to tell which actual device you are connected to that router from so uh your computer might be 192.168.0.0 uh, you might have a phone connected to the wi-fi that might be 192.168.0.1 um smart tv if you have one of those could be 192.168.0.2 and so on and so forth so it's going to be 192.168. i believe something point something but zero point something is pretty typical um regardless there are ways for you to spoof which ip address you are um connecting to the internet from or something like that so uh if you were able to modify your internet traffic so that it looked like it was coming from alan hancock's ip address instead of your home then your internet traffic 
you know, anyone looking at your internet traffic would think, oh, uh, these requests are being made from Alan Hancock, not actually from your home. So you could be sitting in your home uh, doing all this internet browsing or doing all these, uh, you know, weird, uh, whatever hacking you might want to do, and it might look like it's coming from Alan Hancock, and it might throw people off the scent because they can't tell that it's you. They might think that it's someone from Alan Hancock. Uh, the reason why you might want to do that if you are a hacker is not necessarily for like web browsing or something like that, but it might be something like if you are hosting a website and you're trying to make it look like you are actually a major bank's website, bank.com, let's say. If you are trying to make it look like you are bank.com, then you could try to spoof your IP address. And what that would mean is that if you make it look like you are using bank.com's IP address, then people trying to connect to bank.com might get redirected to your website instead because all that network infrastructure that does all the routing and actually connecting you to the website that you're trying to visit might see, oh, here's bank.com because like I know this IP address, this IP address is bank.com. So I'm going to connect the user who is trying to go to bank.com to this website with this IP address, and then they might end up to the fake version. Um, this is especially effective. I talked about this actually, uh, when we were talking about VPNs, I believe this is really effective. If someone is sitting in a place with public Wi-Fi and they are spoofing a whole bunch of popular websites, let's say a whole bunch of banking websites, uh, e-commerce websites, um, you know, Google, Microsoft, uh, Office 365, like login information for a whole bunch of, they're trying to collect login information for a whole bunch of these different things. They're trying to get data, they're trying to get banking information, all that kind of stuff. What they can do is they can spoof the IP addresses um, within that public network, sort of. Uh, what they're doing, what they'll typically do is they'll make a fake version of the public network which people might connect to thinking that it's the real version if they name the public network the right thing. And then when that person tries to go to bank.com, uh, they'll get sent through the fake public network. And the fake public network will say, oh, they're trying to go to bank.com. I know that IP address, it goes here. And then it gets rerouted to the uh, fake phishing site for bank.com rather than actually going to the real bank.com so they're able to sort of intercept that kind of thing and spoof the bank.com website and collect a whole bunch of information that way which is why you would want to do something like a vpn uh on any network that looks like public network if you connect to any random cafe or something like that but that's uh that's a whole thing that's spoofing sniffing is an interesting one because it is all about intercepting computer communications. Uh, this used to be possible through uh, wired networks by plugging in a little device into the wired network and then looking at all the traffic that is happening on that wired network. Um, that actually still exists even because um, there's a, a whole line of work called penetration testers, which are people who try to break into a building's uh, or an organization's uh, network and all that kind of stuff and see if they can identify any weaknesses where they, a, an actual real hacker could do the same thing if they wanted to. So they're pretending to be hackers in order to figure out what a real hacker might be able to do so they can fix security issues. And that's actually something that they will do is they will, they might uh, physically break into a building after hours, uh, go around and try to see like, hey, here's a bunch of computers that are connected into the wall through ethernet cables. Uh, we're just going to plug a little listening device into this network and we can intercept all the traffic going between this computer and the network and see what is going on. So that's the idea with sniffing is you're intercepting network traffic 
and you might be looking at what the traffic is doing. You might end up trying to modify that traffic so you can um, send fake messages to uh, servers or something like that. You might try to look at the traffic, the web traffic that is being sent through your sniffer and say, okay, they're trying to go to bank.com. I'm going to redirect it to my spoofed bank.com. So sniffing and spoofing can actually uh, work together in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a lot of ways in which sniffing can happen. Uh, very famously, the NSA essentially does large scale sniffing of the entirety of the American populace. They typically um, have what's known as domain name servers, uh, which I won't really get into, but they have all these servers that help uh, internet traffic go from your computer to the web server or from the web server back to your computer. Uh, it's bouncing through a whole bunch of servers and the NSA actually built some of these massive servers and they're able to collect a whole bunch of data on what people are actually doing. So that is sniffing. Um, specifically packet sniffing. Uh, a packet is a piece of information sent through the internet uh, that will have things like the origin, so maybe your computer, the destination, so maybe your uh, the website that you're trying to connect to, and any data that you are sending that website, although it will typically be encrypted, but more on that later. That's packet sniffing, where they're trying to intercept network communication like that. There's also uh, ward drivers, which um, actually drive around physical locations, and they try to identify um, Wi-Fi connections that don't actually have any sort of uh, password requirement or security, you know, cryptographic security or anything like that, where they could possibly connect to those Wi-Fi networks, uh, install bad software, or try to monitor traffic or all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's just two types of uh, sniffing right there. There's a lot, a lot, a lot more. I actually talk about those more types of uh, sniffers here. You have war driving, if you're driving around looking for insecure networks that you can try to um, connect to. There's war biking, war cycling, war walking, war jogging, war blank for any mode of transfer, uh, for any mode of transportation or um, trying to s identify these open networks. And once you find an open network, then comes uh, root kitting usually, which is installing bad software on that network so that you can then maliciously start spying on what people are doing on that network or maybe serving them ads or something like that. It's a whole mess. And then the packet servers that I talked about before, which is when you're just looking at network traffic and trying to um, gain some sort of information from it or modify that information. And then there's security hacking, um, which most of us know of as hacking. Uh, uh, actual people who are in the scene would say, well, security hacking is the proper term because hacking used to mean just anyone who was really into doing weird things with technology at a maybe more than enth enthusiast level. So there's hardware hacking, there's uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of stuff. Um, Security hacking would be the act of uh, breaking into secured computer systems. It's also known as cracking in some cases. You break into uh, computers, servers, and networks to steal data, and then disclose that data in whatever way. Uh, either you, um, I guess someone breaking in is actually doing the unauthorized data disclosure just by getting access to it. And then they might sell it or put it up on a site like WikiLeaks or something like that, depending on what their motive is. There's a lot of different motives for security hacking like that. <sighs> Regardless, that is all unauthorized data disclosure. Those are all different types of unauthorized data disclosure that you might see. Now, the next type of security loss is incorrect data modification. And this can come from a number of different sources. For example, human error. You might uh, mistype something into a database. You might accidentally overwrite something that you're not supposed to. 
um, this could, uh, you know, that this could actually be not just in the, the database sense where you're messing with things on the database or something like that, but you could also accidentally mess with a website and accidentally declare a sale that isn't really existing and piss a whole bunch of people off or accidentally even create a sale, uh, make a bunch of customers happy and uh, piss off management and the business who didn't think there was actually a sale going on until you accidentally did it. Um, you can have uh, employees following procedures incorrectly, so procedures for accessing or modifying, backing up, uh, restoring data could be done incorrectly, which could result in data being, well, modified incorrectly, data being destroyed, uh, an old backup uh, taking over a current copy of a database and destroying data that way. Um, all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it could be uh, just human error here. When a, when a human does that kind of work uh, incorrectly, that could be, that could result in incorrect data modification. You can have errors in the system where uh, either the way that a system is designed facilitates errors, or you can actually have uh, mistakes. I guess uh, mistakes in the code would actually be more of a human error, but the actual design of a system can cause errors by itself. Uh, I won't really review it that heavily, but we talked about the lost update problem in chapter five, when um, two people were both able to buy the last two tickets for a concert. So they both bought the same two tickets, uh, even though they should not have been able to do that because there were only two. So two tickets kind of magically appeared from nowhere. Uh, that lost update problem had to do with uh, sort of this asynchronous access to the database where everything looked like it was functioning correctly on both customers' side. It looked like they were able to actually buy the tickets that they wanted to, um, but the way that everything went, the way that everything happened, um, those tickets were not actually handled correctly. Uh, you can go back and review chapter five if you want to double check what that lost update problem example was. Uh, malicious modification by an authorized user can absolutely happen as well. Uh, just a very brief example might be an employee changing their own salary in the database so that they get paid more or something like that. That's malicious in the sense of uh, trying to, uh, doing harm to the company, uh, quote unquote harm because the company isn't actually a person, but um, doing something that they're not supposed to, uh, which is modifying data like that. Uh, someone could also modify a whole bunch of stuff in order to do some sort of like white collar crime, like if they're trying to launder money or something like that, or kind of skim some profit off the top, that could also be some sort of malicious modification. So it's also very possible that um, when we talked about the cryptocurrency discussion in, uh, I, f I forget what chapter it was off the top of my head, but when that one technical expert was able to hide a whole bunch of programs from uh, typical resource monitoring programs or task manager programs or something like that, that could have potentially been the result of some malicious modification uh, to how this system worked or something like that. That's just one possible avenue. And then you've got your security hacking, of course. Um, someone who hacks into a system and messes with stuff could cause incorrect data modification. And then finally, faulty recovery actions after disaster. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit with the uh, backing up and restoring um, data. But if there is a disaster, typically you're going to have some sort of secure backup that would hopefully be safe from that disaster and you would be able to restore 
that copy of the data and hopefully it's not too out of date but if the um, recovery actions are faulty it's actually very possible to um, maybe combine databases that shouldn't have been combined maybe you're adding in a whole bunch of data from different backups by accident uh, if the backing up and restoring procedures aren't the best so you can actually destroy or modify data through faulty recovery actions after a disaster happens. Now, faulty service is essentially um, problems that result because of uh, incorrect system operation, whether that's malicious or not. Um, you can have human error. So if someone is using a certain machine wrong, or if they are not backing things up correctly, or if they are uh, typing in the wrong commands into a server and they accidentally uh, delete a whole bunch of stuff and then the server stops working, um, that could all be the result, uh, or that could all be the cause of faulty service. And it could be from, you know, inadvertently making procedural mistakes. So you're trying to follow some uh, instructions on how to back up a server or how to uh, do a certain operation. You type in the wrong character in the wrong place, everything gets deleted or modified or whatever. Um, and you can, yeah, that would count as faulty service here. And like I kind of alluded to, it can actually include uh, data modification as a result of faulty service. Uh, if something starts going wrong, it can modify data and that would be very bad. There's also usurpation, which is when a computer criminal would invade a computer system and replace some sort of legitimate program with its own. So uh, they might um, say, get rid of the, let's say they have a replacement database management system that looks like the one that you're currently using, but actually uh, goes and encrypts your data. It cryptographically locks it to the point of being unusable, or it's like, changing values or slowly but surely changing values or something like that in order to disrupt a business or all kinds of stuff. Um, that changing of values could even be, uh, that changing of data could even be an attempt to make it look like someone is doing some sort of uh, white collar crime, uh, trying to fudge some numbers and that might get the IRS on them. and. That would be interesting, actually, if a hacker was able to do that. I haven't heard of anything like that happening, but it would be cool. I mean, obviously really bad for that business, but from a technical standpoint, it would be impressive. You'd have to give them that. And then, of course, there's faulty recovery actions after a disaster. Um, there's a huge thing with um, some types of computers, like server computers or something like that, where if they suddenly lose power, uh, things start to go bad because maybe they were doing some really important operation and now the place that they were writing data to or the data that they were accessing or something like that is completely locked off or it wasn't completely written and now there's corrupted or incorrect data or something like that. Uh, maybe things in the actual um, programs have managed to change and stop working because... Uh, a weird like surge in power or a weird um, power outage or something like that completely caused things to go haywire, which I don't know if I've necessarily heard of that happening, but it may not be completely out of the picture. Even things like um, random photons uh, managing to get into the server if it's not shielded from that, that's an actual uh, concern at some levels of computation because photons can actually uh, flip bits. If you remember the computer data discussion that we had, um, they, a photon might actually turn a bit that was supposed to be off on. And sometimes that effect is negligible. Sometimes the effect is stronger than you might think. Um, so failing to recover from natural events and disasters like that could cause uh, faulty service. Then we have uh, denial of service, which is the inability 
for, let's say, a customer to access a website or, you know, for someone to access a particular service. Um, you could have human error cause denial of service where a person accidentally unplugs the web server that hosts a company's storefront and then customers can't actually buy from that company. They get like a, uh, I forget what the error code actually is, but they get an error code. Um, the company's web server is not responding. They're not able to actually access it. And obviously this loses the business money. Um, all that is actually another reason why the cloud can be really helpful here because um, even if there is one error, especially a content uh, distribution network or something like that, because if there is human error and one web server gets un unplugged in one location, the cloud um, service might be able to redirect users to a still running instance elsewhere. So something like human error uh, it becomes a little harder to cause a denial service denial of service um, event because of human error. Now there are denial of service attacks um, where a malicious person will try to flood a web server with requests, and that web server is going to try to answer every single request if it's not properly prepared. It'll try to answer every single request, and but it might get overwhelmed and uh, stop being able to respond to things. Um, which means that if there's a denial of service attack on uh, a particular website and then a legitimate customer is also trying to access that particular website, that legitimate customer is not going to be able to get service. The loading times are going to be really long because the web server is getting extremely bogged down with this denial, denial of service attack. And it might even cause the web server to completely crash which is what a lot of uh, people doing this kind of attack might want. Um, now, of course, if it's one person doing that kind of attack, all of these requests are going to come from one IP address. So a lot of uh, web servers, well, a lot of web servers and you know companies and websites and stuff actually utilize uh, companies like Cloudflare to protect against this kind of attack where they will partially using artificial intelligence and that kind of stuff, determine if certain requests seem very suspicious and block those requests before they can even hit the web server so the web server is completely um, fine. So they can block a denial of service attack just fine because that kind of attack may just come from a couple of IP addresses. Now a distributed de denial of service attack is going to be a little different because this involves an attacker building a giant botnet. They're going to um, spread malware throughout a whole bunch of uh, computers. They're actually, it's probably going to be a, a worm of sorts, and we'll get into the definitions of the different types of malware, but they're going to spread a worm into a whole bunch of different computers, and that worm might have the job of replicating itself, setting itself out to other computers in order to build this network of computers infected with a swarm. And then when given the signal, uh, they might all start pinging um, a particular web server that they don't like. And now all of a sudden you have a ton of different requests coming from a massive amount of computers, all with different IP addresses. And because this is this is distributed over a massive amount of computers, possibly in the hundreds or thousands, um, it's going to be even more requests than was possible with a single uh, denial of service attack. Because a one single computer can only handle so many requests like that, but thousands of them can do potentially a lot of damage. Now, protection like Cloudflare protection might um, actually be able to mitigate this kind of stuff. Uh, but there have been instances where they get overwhelmed. Uh, usually, I believe if they go down, then they prevent access from the actual botnet or you know, whatever type of attack it is getting into the web servers that they're protecting, which means that all of those web servers are unavailable, even if they're still running. I believe that's how it works, just so that, you know, there's no... Uh, breaching of that defensive wall and then leaving everything behind it exposed. Rather, they just shut down everything to protect, uh, sort of keep those web servers in their own insular bubble. Um, 
So it, that can be a sense of a sort of denial of service if they are able to uh, take down Cloudflare or some other kind of provider like that. But with companies like Cloudflare, Cloudflare being so um, sophisticated, sometimes you see things slowing down. Sometimes you think you see things uh, coming to a halt, but it doesn't get as bad as it used to, I believe. And then, of course, disaster can cause denial of service if a server is taken up by a disaster or a critical network infrastructure is taken up by a disaster. Then that can stop people from accessing a particular web server. So that in and of itself is denial of service. Now, springboarding off of that, we have a loss of infrastructure providing security loss um, because you have uh, this you know, massive network of fiber optic cables that can easily be cut by construction equipment or destroyed by things like earthquakes or fires or hurricanes or whatever. Um, you know, underwater, there might be earthquakes that cut fiber optic cables. There might be um, sharks that get them. Uh, really, the big loss of infrastructure things that affect security like this are going to be um, local loss of infrastructure that destroys a organization's um, connection to the internet or a uh, person's connection to the internet. So if a web server is hosted at a particular location and that fiber optic cable leading to that location gets severed, then that is no longer accessible. Um, the different ways we might see security loss here are human error, like we said before, uh, malicious attacks would be someone actually digging in and severing um, infrastructure themselves. Uh, so cutting cables, either main cables that uh, service a lot of people, including a particular building, or that building's connection to the fiber optic, optic cable, stuff like that. And then you got natural disasters like we talked about. So right here, what we have is a table that... Uh, sort of shows where the different threats and the different type of losses can actually intersect. So for example, um, the a computer crime threat leading to a uh, denial of service loss would be the result, uh, would, would sort of mean a denial of service attack of some sort. Human error leading to incorrect data modification might be procedural mistakes, incorrect procedures, ineffective accounting controls or system errors, any of that kind of thing. Natural disasters intersecting with loss of infrastructure. Uh, that loss looks like property loss. Um, so what you could do is pause this video to take a look at the table yourself, see where the different types of threats and the different types of losses Kind of intersect to provide different results or have different causes or something like that uh you can also access this in section 10 1 of the textbook if you uh if you so choose now the goal of information system security like this is to stop all threats if at all possible but that's not possible for it might be possible to stop most threats with uh, some good practices and some common sense and all that kind of stuff, but it will never be possible to stop everything because this stuff is constantly evolving. We see new types of malware. Uh, we see new types of human error all the time as well, especially as our computer systems evolve and evolve and evolve, and we have to try to stay up to date with all that. And we see new types of natural disasters at new frequencies, uh, it seems. So we'll never be able to stop all possible threats. So then what we have to think about is how can we minimize loss from the, thre the threats that we can't stop? We're trying to hit that perfect balance between the cost versus effectiveness of our security systems. We can't sink too much into this because as a as an organization, we might be out of a lot of money and, you know, what use is a really, really, really good security system if we have nothing that we can protect because we've run out of budget, but you still want it to be effective. So knowing sort of this 
I, they, these broad ideas of security and knowing that it is important is really important to anyone who is in control of an information system. And hopefully it will give you the vocabulary to actually interact with security professionals maybe sort of make a bridge between security professionals and um, sort of the upper management of the business in order to try to make a good middle ground. Upper management might want to save more money. Security professionals might want to go a little overkill on security, although I would kind of trust what they're saying uh, to quite a, to some extent. But if you can't afford everything, if you can't afford the best of everything, then trying to bridge these gaps, trying to meet in the middle, justify why security is a necessary cost and try to increase that budget while also trying to manage expectations with regards to security. That is the goal of working with information systems security right here. And that's the kind of role that would be important for anyone watching this video. Unless you end up going into security, in which case your role would actually be more on the security side here. But, you know, even, even for working on a personal information system, uh, right? This isn't, this may not even be a thing where you necessarily have management to consult with or security people that you can directly talk to. You can probably do your own research and see what people are recommending. Um, but, in the end, you kind of have to balance this within yourself, balance the urge to minimize cost with the urge to uh, have effective security so that everything is safe. You need to manage your budget, you need to manage the risk, all that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, cybercrime is a pretty big problem. Uh, the 2019 study published some data from companies that reported incidents of cybercrime in 2015, 16, and 17. And of all the companies that were studied here, you see that almost 100% of them experienced some sort of malware. And for most of the rest, we're looking still at like the 60%, 50%, 40% on the lower end with ransomware. Uh, Closer to 20% in 2017 because ransomware wasn't used that frequently until like 2016, 2017, uh, sort of around the time where we started seeing WannaCry. Um, but there's a lot of companies, a lot of uh, probably larger companies out here experiencing some sort of cybercrime related problem, which is bad. <laughs> So security is really important and it needs to be considered from the very beginning. If that's not convincing enough, there's also the amount of money that uh, all these different types of attacks were costing businesses in 2017 and 2018 up into the millions for things like malware and web-based attacks, denial of service, even malicious insiders were a huge problem here. Ransomware, despite not being all that prolific, was still up in the uh, close to 1 million range. Not quite 1 million, it looks like, but it's pretty close right there. So ransomware even was uh, very um, prolific. Ransomware, by the way, is preventing a person or a company or something like that from using a computer until they are... Uh, until the hacker is given a certain amount of money. So like restricting access to the computer, holding parts of the computer or files or something like that ransom until the ransom is paid. And then it got even worse uh, because the thing that you used to be able to do was you could just kind of turn off your computer, um, access the actual data from your computer through a different means. So like maybe, um, loading a live um, USB with a different operating system on it, or actually taking out the hard drive and uh, use, like plugging it into another safe computer and accessing the data like that. So what people started doing then was um, encrypting data 
until uh, a ransom was paid. And then once that ransom was paid, usually in some kind of cryptocurrency, so it's not traceable, um, then they would provide the decryption key. And we'll talk a little bit more about encrypting later. But that amount of money that businesses had to pay to get their data back and get their computers back and all that kind of stuff was pretty big, especially for ransomware not being all that prolific back in like 2017. And yet here it is over $500,000 uh, from ransomware. Okay, so that is, I know it's a pretty beefy video, but that's a overview of information systems security. In the next video, we're going to talk about how companies or organizations can respond to security threats.